Hello, everyone, and welcome to our peer-to-peer -peer masterclass. And hello, make a big welcome to Ruben. That's it. Um, about the session. So during this masterclass, you will learn how to use Git and GitHub to improve your code base, manage feature inter integration, and use your GitHub profile to attract tech recruiters and amaze team leads. Thank you very much, Ruben. Um, so you will learn about features like branching for working on features separately, tracking process using GitHub project board, structuring your GitHub to show the work you want to pursue. Perfect. Yeah. And about you? So you are Amsterdam-based creative developer working cross-disciplinary within the field of visual communication, interaction, and creative technology for over five years. Oh, long time, long time. Long time. You look so young. Focused on creating unique digital experiences using creative code and interactive design to realize ideas. Thank right. you very much, Ruben. Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay. You okay? Yeah. Is the mic okay. uh, working? Fine. It's on. Thank you okay. very much. I have to unlock this for a second. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Excited for this. <laughs> All right, well, welcome everyone for coming. Um, this is, I think, the first peer-to-peer -peer sort of masterclass that's been given at Codam. And I hope you guys will all enjoy this. It's some crucial information you will need if you want to become a good developer later on. And, um, well, yeah, if you want to add me on somewhere, you can do it here. I'm in desperate need of attention, so <laughs> please do it. Um, it's going to be just a small talk about how to use Git and GitHub as a professional. The clicker doesn't work, so I have to go to my laptop each time. A little about myself, I've been working with companies like Divine It, Louder Minds, um, Dept, and my own agency, uh, yeah, Louder Minds, but also Goodlist. Um, I've been working as a freelancer with these companies, and this is where I learned my skills with Git and GitHub, and mainly how to use them properly to manage projects and to, well, create products that uh, last and are just uh, managed very well. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you already told me, but I've I told you guys, but I've been working with uh, visual communication, which is just a very fancy word for websites, UIs, and anything that's designable. Uh, this is something I've been working on for the last five years, with the last three years being a professional in it. Um, so I hope that that's at least somewhat of a qualification to give this presentation. Um, next part. Some of the topics we'll be covering today are just Git as a gen in general. It's a tool, of course, you have at the command line. Uh, Git and GitHub are actually separate things. GitHub is just a platform you use to showcase your projects and to flex with your friends how many followers you have. And Git is just a tool that you use to create commits, a sort of timeline of your project. Many features of Git are useful branching, for example, to have um, independent workflows or in a, uh, manage features in a very easy way. All right. First reason, why use Git? Why not just do everything in one file? Why not just um, create an awful project? Um, well, one of the main things I've seen with a friend, actually, is that to integrate his code with someone else's code, they copied the files to another computer and then line by line added in without uh, with trying to not get any bugs. Uh, well, thankfully, there's an easier way to do that. Uh, Git gives a nice way of pulling, pushing code to the server. You, as a user, can or at least as a developer can pull that code as well. And by doing that in a small, easy way, um, you don't have any problems with integrating code. And because it's way more manageable that way, you can, well, I guess it's just easier to work together as a team. One of the reasons you should also learn is literally every company uses it. So if you don't learn it, I doubt you'll get a good job as a developer. At least from my experience with all the companies, knowing how to use Git properly will elevate you in the ranks when it comes to developing. And also, um, a lot of team leads, actually pretty much all the team leads, know how to use Git properly. If you want to become a team lead later or just have a lot of control over the end product, you need to know how your tools work. And I guess yeah, Git is just a good tool to learn in the end for these kind of features. First thing we're going to talk about with Git are commits. Commits are a way to encapsulate small pieces of code. Um, I guess you could sort of see it as packing your bag for travel. Every commit is sort of your own bag. You have your socks, underwear. Um, I don't know what else you take on a vacation. I think those are the only things I take. But they're just a way to encapsulate small pieces of code. 
let's say you're working on a new feature, sort of the user input or user input validation, you want to have that in its own container. Because in the future, if you suddenly find a bug, it would be nice to sort of go into the history of your project and find out where each piece started. If you're suddenly 10, 10 commits already in, and then in 10 commits, 10th commit, you find that there's some kind of user interface problem, it'd be nice to go back and then figure out, oh, OK, my friend made this awful code here, and I can fix it. Uh, because I can go back through the commits. One thing with commits as well is that a good commit sort of message will describe what is in the code. So initial commit or second commit or tenth commit, it, it can be done at least a little bit better. It's also one of the things we'll be talking about. And with GitHub and Git and just small commits, you can integrate small features sort of granularly. So every time a small thing is finished, tested, it can be integrated, it can be in its own small commit. This way, one feature can be built up of small bits, and every time something goes wrong, you can just revert back to something that works and start over again to figure out what the issue could be. One example of how to make a good commit is, let's say you have your files done, some user validation files, and you can add those with this command git add user input.c. I've seen a lot of you guys use the dot instead of just a file. It's totally valid. Just watch out with what you add. Um, but in this way, you can add individual files to what's called the staging area. Staging area is comparable, again, to your suitcase, but in this case, it's still open. So you haven't closed it yet, it's not shipped over to Ibiza or wherever you're going to party. Um, but let's say you're with a family and every suitcase is the same color, same size. Wouldn't it be that nice if you suddenly have your mom's suitcase? So you can add messages to your commits. A message is just a descriptive way of saying, oh, this commit is the user input. Uh, this commit is the, um, I don't know, sort of like a small readme changes for in the future, documentation, anything like that. And then eventually, um, when it's all committed, you have a sort of new history part in your Git line. The first one could be, for example, initial commit. But then the second part could be added error messages, or the most recent one we added, the feature user input. It would be nice, now this sort of creates a system where it's nice that you can track where you are in your project. This way, when new people want to add something, they can go back, oh, okay, this part is when we added this, so if I want to build on top of that, I can just look at that code and figure out what was added there. Um, we also have some small commit message tips. This is just, it's a lot of information, I know. But this is an example of how I would write commit messages. I've been using this for the last three years. It's based on, well, I forgot the name of it, but something I think it's called conventional commit messages. And what this creates is, for one, a lot of emojis, but <laughs> the second part what it creates is a nice descriptive way of understanding what the goal is of every commit. Because not every commit is the same, some are just small refactors where nothing on the code actually changed. And some of the commits are actually ways where you add a feature, or maybe we fixed a bug, or this one's just for performance, for example. And by doing it in this structured way, um, everyone in the um, team knows what each commit is for. Because sometimes when you just say, oh, removed bugs, it's a little bit too vague. This bug could be related to some color issue, or this bug could be related to, well, crashing the whole program. By doing it this way, we have a more descriptive way of what every commit is for. So one of the problems with this emoji thing is that it's not very difficult to do via the command line. If all of, I think some of you are working with VS Code. In VS Code, there's a nice way of going through VS Code to add commits. Something I forgot to add in this slide, but <laughs> it's one nice way to also add more data or more descriptive data to your messages. You can take a picture of this, but I think if you just look up conventional Git, uh, Git commit messages, you'll find something just like this as well. Next topic, pushing and pulling. Um, I've actually heard a story of one guy who didn't understand how to pull properly. So what he did is when he pushed code to the, his GitHub profile every time, he would just clone the repo again every time and just keep like 10 copies of his code, which is, I guess, a way to do it. But you're missing out on one of the nice features of GitHub, which is pulling code from another repository, or at least some online repository, to your own local version. A way to do this is with the git remote add uh, command. You set the name of your repository. It could be like origin or Volksphere or whatever it is called, or uh, GitHub. And then you set the link, which is often some kind of HTTPS link. Um, I know with Volksphere it's actually SSH. But uh, that's just an easy way to add the remote uh, of your GitHub repo. After that, you set the Git branch. Uh, I forgot what the M is for, but 
you set the name of your branch uh, with Volksphere, for example, it's actually master. That's one of the terms we're not using that uh, a lot anymore with GitHub, at least. Uh, so often it's called, for example, main or um, base or anything that's sort of the first branch you have in your repo. And after that, we can just push our code. If you see at the local there, those are the commit mess, uh, commits we have so far. And we can push them to the origin and then main, for example. Just an easy command to push all your code to the re remote repository. Eventually, when you have done that, you should be an exact copy of your own code, your local version on your computer, and the one that's remote. So as, you, as you can see, all the commits are pushed over to the remote version now. And this way, we can just have copies pretty much of our own code, but then remote. Um, yeah, and for example, Volksphere or GitHub, those are sort of online repositories. And the nice thing with especially GitHub is that you can work together on the same project. Well, now the pulling problem. <laughs> Let's say someone else added a commit to your project or you added one to your project and now you want to pull it to your local uh, computer. Uh, the histories aren't identical, so you have to use the pull command to get that code to your own version. Um, one important condition, and this is really important, is that there are no change files up on the moment you're going to pull. Sometimes, for example, when you have some small, uh, some small changes uh, that you have, but then midway through those changes, you're like, oh, actually, there's some code that I still need to pull, because otherwise my repo isn't complete for what it is now. You just do git pull origin master, and then the most recent changes from your GitHub or Volksphere are pulled into your local version. This is the way to publish code, like commit it, publish code, and then eventually pull it as well. It's not actually that difficult. Um, it's just a lot of small steps um, with each of them having a reason why they exist, but something you just have to figure out, I guess, during the whole way we're working with Git. And then we have one of the cooler features, in my opinion, branching. This way, we can have more change, like independent workflows in our GitHub. For example, this one is the feature user input. The nice thing about branching this way is that your master branch isn't affected until the feature gets added back in. This way, uh, for example, if we have a feature that's a little bit uh, not finished yet, we can have it on, on its own branch. And this way, we can do the testing there. We can do the checking. Everything that's needed, we can do it on that branch. And then when we're done with the whole feature, we're sure that it works. We can integrate it back into our master branch. Then we'll eventually, you get this next step which is merging. As you can see, feature user input is pretty much finished. Meanwhile, there were some more commits to master. We've pulled those back in feature input as well. And now we're done. We can put it back into the master branch. An example you could use this is, for example, um, let's say you're working on a C project, something like get next line, for example, um, and you want to add your own custom calloc function. A nice way to add that is via these branches. Uh, and then when you want to integrate them, you're sure that you've tested the branch, it's all done, it's all finished, and you can add it back into the master branch. How do we make branches? Let's say you first have your master branch, you've been working on this for a little bit. Well, some of the commands you can use to fix, uh, to add a new branch are git branch feature user input. Pretty much everything here can be custom. Some characters are not allowed. I like to use a name and then dot slash another name because it's easy to understand what each branch is for. Because if we just say user input, it's a little bit vague if there's like a small fix that needs to be quick, uh, quickly done or another branch that is added very for like a long-term part of the whole project. Well, at least with that command, we can make these extra branches. When we have uh, built it, we want to go into the branch and start working from that point on. Then we can use the git checkout feature user input function uh, command this way, we switch to another one. Eventually, um, if you're a little bit quicker, you can figure out that there's actually one long command you can do for this, git checkout dash b. This way, you create a branch, and you also go check it out to sort of go into that branch. Sometimes you've seen, if you have, for example, have installed um, Z shell or some kind of extra shell over your bash, you often see the between quotes, like master, for example, that defines the branch that you're currently in. So by doing this, you also change it in your shell eventually, so you can always see what branch you're currently in. If you want to merge branches, for example, you're done with the feature user input, and you're like, well, we can add it now to our main branch, you can just use these commands. You have to select a branch to absorb the secondary branch. If you're in the main branch, you want to add the feature user input branch to your main branch. You just go to the master branch, and then you merge it with um, the branch that you want to go into. So you say which branch you want to merge, and it goes into the master branch. It's a very easy sort of development workflow, but the nice thing is this way, 
every time there might be a mistake here, it's sort of encapsulated until the point where you're sure it's done and you can add it to your main workflow. Well, that's just a little bit of, about Git. Git in itself isn't that complicated. There are a lot of things that are advanced that you can add as well. Um, but in and of itself, if you just know when to use uh, certain commands, it's very easy to manage feature integration and always have a sort of clean workflow to work with. Um, in my opinion, Git needs to be taught a little bit more on Codon because currently there aren't any courses that are part of the curriculum where it's really taught. We had a little bit during the selection month, but in general there isn't that much um, around the course that explains how to use Git properly. And often people use the three or four commands that they've learned to push code and pull code. Then we get to the next part, GitHub. Uh, some of the topics I will talk about is why I need to get, create a good profile, why it is important to write good documentation, and also how to manage features uh, using the feature board that's actually on GitHub. It's a nice way, if you want to work only on GitHub, uh, to manage feature integration. This is at least one example of a GitHub profile. Uh, let's, I think most of you are probably around this level now, where you have like three projects, no profile picture, there's no documentation, there's no name, and that's fine. But GitHub is very important to sort of use if you want to eventually get a job later. Often tech recruiters will look at your GitHub profile to look at what the quality of your code is. Actually, with I think that was my most recent job when we worked at Depth. They looked at my GitHub profile, we went through one of my projects, and we sort of looked at the code and said, oh, why didn't you do this? Well, that's because of this. Oh, OK, so you did this. Yeah, I did that because of that. The important thing is with GitHub is that you manage a good profile to sort of show what you want to do later on and what your current interests are. GitHub is sort of a way of visual communication because you're trying to explain who you are. And some of these, this profile, for example, is from a friend of mine. He's been working for a long time already, and he knows how to explain himself through the small parts of GitHub. Um, yeah, so it's just really important to give a good GitHub. One of the most difficult things often when you have to write things about yourself um, is that it always feels a little bit uh, vague or fake what you're writing about yourself. My thing, for example, currently is bachelor's in computer science, year 23 at Totem Coding College, creating unique digital products using creative code and interactive design. For just average developers, that doesn't mean a lot. Like, what is interactive design? What are creating unique digital products? Get Next Line doesn't feel like a unique digital product. But it's a sort of vague way of, you don't have to explain what you are doing. You need to have someone else sort of convince what would be a good position for a job for you later on. So if they need someone who can work a little bit in the creative side, but also start programming, then writing something like this is nice because you're sort of putting yourself in a position where you say, I can do multiple things. I, I'm not only working with um, C or C++, I just like to create products. Yeah, and that's just a general way of writing. You have to, use, you have to, you have to be a little bit general when writing uh, about text about yourself. You don't have to be exact where you say, oh, I'm a C++ developer. That could be a little bit too exact and could limit your job options later on as well. In general, writing text, you just have to be a little bit over the top. Um, being a little bit fake is fine as long as you're real during the actual moment when it matters. You have to always think in solutions. Don't just say, I'm a C++ developer, but say, I know how to make projects scalable. I know how to make projects uh, user-friendly. Because of this way, they understand that they can put you into, into positions which often require a little bit more creative thinking instead of just saying, oh, can you make this button bigger, or can you put a little bit more to the left? Import it's also important to add your own ambitions. In my case, I'm a creative developer, so I like to do creative stuff. If you add those kind of things, it's also showing what you want to pursue later on. If someone wants to hire you, they understand, OK, so currently you wants to just have a small job, and in the future you might want to do more creative work. It's also another important part, writing documentation. Um, instead of just writing, this function does this, uh, you could explain a little bit more how and when it's used. Certain parts of documentation are very difficult to write. Um, honest thing to say is that, for example, the MediaLibX documentation uh, with Harm Smith's documentation, I found it a little bit difficult to go through. Um, and I feel like some other people I talked to also had the same problem. In general, it's just important to write good documentation because if multiple people have to use this project or some other thing that's important about um, uh, your project, so for example, some features, some, some small components. It's important to write good documentation. In general, when writing documentation, you have to think about who is it for. Is it for just a developer who needs to work on certain parts, or is it for the whole team in general to understand? 
Um, you have to also think about what your goal is. Is this just supposed to explain why we're using this certain variable, or is it supposed to explain um, where this is all used? Because certain functions could be a little bit vague if you have to write them quickly, which is not a good thing in general, but writing documentation can at least help the process a little bit for the next person who's trying to look at your code. Another thing to think about, which is actually what Harm did very well, is think about caveats in your code. Small things uh, which I have like edge cases, for example, which um, not everyone always thinks about, but writing those clearly in your documentation can help someone in the future when they're, when they're stuck. All right, and then one of the other big parts, feature tracking. Normally when you're working on your own, you don't have to do a lot of feature, tr feature tracking. You sort of know from yourself what the part is that you're working on. But uh, when you're working in teams, for example, some of the later projects that mention the curriculum, they, uh, it, it's very important to um, know who's going to work on what feature, what are the issues of certain features, why does this not work, why does that work. Sort of recording that data is very important um, to sort of track where you, where you are with the project. Thankfully, the GitHub has a nice Kanban board. You can open it, for example, on the Projects tab of your project. Often one person has control of the whole project, so they can start the project. You can add it through the Add Project button eventually there. And then you have what's actually in the beginning a sort of um, empty space here. But you can add your own columns. And this is the common board, at least, is one thing that pretty much every company uses as well to distrib distribute tickets. You can set up your board this way. Um, you have tickets that you can add. Uh, if you turn those into issues as well, you can add way more text to them uh, in general. You can have a title for it, for example, um, screen reader support for navbar. Then you can give the body, for example, oh, um, as a user, I want to have more control for the website or understand the website better by having a screen reader level for a screen reader feature for the navbar. Eventually, when you convert them to an issue, you can add way more data there as well. You can have milestones to sort of understand when a feature is uh, finished. You can add labels, for example, oh, this one has to do with UI, this one has to do with just pure code. And you can assign it to people as well. And that's a really important one, because let's say you're working on mini shell later on. If you have all the sort of topics into separate features, you can assign this uh, task to this person and this task to another one. Uh, which is just a very nice way of splitting all the tasks uh, for everyone, and there's a way more elegant way of tracking all the features. Um, yeah, I think in general that's a lot of the GitHub features as well. We also have preparing for the feature. In my opinion, you're learning Git the next year or one and a half years when you're working here, studying at Codem is very important. I can promise you that on your internship, they expect you to know Git. It's not something you're going to learn at the internship. Git is something you're supposed to learn when you're still learning on your own about how to make projects and um, how to manage these kind of things. Management overall with Git and GitHub is uh, something you'll learn over the years. It's not something you can learn just in a year. Um, if you want to become a team lead later on or some kind of managing developer, there are um, reasons why you need to learn Git. If someone says, oh, you're going to manage this team now, you need to understand how to assign tickets, how to spread over features to a point where someone can finish it in a day, or you can have stand-ups in the morning where everyone explains how they are with a feature. In general, that's the whole talk. Uh, it's a pretty short one because it's mostly just concepts. When you actually start working on projects, you'll understand where all the parts are managed and how they work together. Um, I think, yeah, I managed a lot of time to do, I planned a lot of time for questions as well because, of course, there are a lot of things not everyone might understand in one go. Uh, Basile, I don't think we have the cube. Do you have the cube? Is it? Ah, yes, it's obviously from there. Well, I was. Uh, I think it's a good time to start some questions. Does anyone have any questions? Anyone to start with? Yes, be prepared. Uh, yes, I have a question about the branching. So you said also in the mass or in the main sequence there can also be adjustments, and you have a branch with different adjustments. I'm not seeing how they can integrate easily without going over each line. Uh, yeah, no, that's a valid question. Yeah, um, like how, how does that work? One thing you always have to do in the morning, uh, except for you know, brushing your teeth, is pulling changes from uh, the code. Let's say you're working on a team. Someone else added a feature. Assuming you don't have any change to your code so far, you need to pull that other, one's, uh, the other person's code into your own code. That way, you're always working on the most recent version of the project. 
Because what happens if you don't pull your code in between, you might be eight commits in into your own feature, and the master branch might already have 10 commits. Suddenly, your two branches have diverged to the point where merging them gets really difficult. And then you get merge conflicts, which are small parts in your code where Git doesn't actually understand which part it needs to add. Um, often you can change these uh, in, in the file. You have certain brackets you'll see. It's a little bit intuitive eventually if um, you can see the brackets. In VS Code, it's a lot more visual. And you can sort of cl uh, click which part of the code you want to integrate. In general, you just always have to pull code. Um, and just don't forget that you need to check up with the rest of what they've added. Um, so otherwise, you get merge conflicts. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I actually have two questions because the follow up on the, the previous yeah. question and my own. Uh, the follow up would be how do I then, do I understand correctly that if I'm working on a branch, I then have to pull the changes from the main as well? Yeah, the so there's one sort of central branch that everyone, that every project has. Often it's called master or main. And that's supposed to be the most recent version of the project. So every time you are working on your own code, um, you want to integrate the most recent changes because uh, you're sort of building up on what is already there. That's why you have an own separate branch. Uh, but if you don't pull in the most recent changes, eventually you, you could be working on almost a whole different project. And from that point on, it just becomes very difficult to manage. Do you just do, you just do git pull and then origin main? OK. Yeah. You can also merge it, uh, but pulling code also often uh, is a solution for it. OK, thanks. And the other question was, you mentioned documentation. What, what do you mean by documentation? Um, documentation? Well, in C or C++, you can use slash slash and then write some code. So just comments in That's, the, that okay. Comments are a way of documentation. But for example, the readme in a project that you often have under, uh, mm -hmm. under all the code, if you are below all the code, if you're at GitHub, that's also a, way, a form of documentation. Um, I don't think I have an example on the slide, but uh, for example, part of documentation is integrating or adding, how does someone use this code? Or how do I integrate this my feature uh, in, into my project? Uh, documenting those kind of things uh, will help someone else use your code, actually. Otherwise, it's just an empty repository that's not very clear. Thanks. Could you give me an example of a chore? as you mentioned in your list of different kinds of commits? Um, well, let's say someone pretty much finished up a commit, but they left some files which are now unused. Uh, a chore could be, for example, oh, cleaned up the repo uh, and removed unused files, or cleaned up the repo and removed uh, certain common bits of code which we now understand are not needed anymore. A chore, just like in a house, is basically just cleaning up uh, certain parts of your code or something that someone has been putting away for a long time. Yeah, it's just, it's, just uh, it's not one that I often use. For example, images that I first had on my repo but are now part of the content management system, I still have in my repo. Removing them is sort of a chore. I guess you could call it that. That's understandable. Thank yeah. you. Um, In the back there, I think. Yeah. We have also some question on YouTube. Uh, the Flying Dutchman. What's the best way to delete, add, or moving things on your GitHub? Um, well... That's also one important thing about Git. Git doesn't actually store your files. It stores the changes between those files. So let's say uh, you first added your first code, and the next commit might be that you removed one of the old functions. Git doesn't actually store an exact copy of your file, or at least a copy of the new changes. It only stores what is changed in between files. Um, one thing that is also uh, seen as a change in Git is the removal of a file. Let's say you have a DS store in your GitHub repo, something often we've all do done often, I think. Uh, one way to just remove that is to remove the file from local repository. Git will see that change, and if you do Git status or something, you will see that suddenly there's a red line uh, that says, oh, the store has been removed. If you eventually put that in a commit and push it as well to your GitHub repo, the file will also be removed on your GitHub repo. Is there a way to visualize the branches? Like I've seen there's a GitHub desktop application, but I've not really looked into it Yeah, the, the Git itself, um, I think, I'm not very sure about if Git itself has one. Often you can have plugins which do have that. Um, and as far as I know, GitHub does have in a sort of, um, I don't know if that's viewable from a couple back. But I think there's a way to change back to... Um, 
hope it loads. I think it's on the Insights tab there. If you eventually go to your GitHub profile and the Insights, I think, I'm not totally sure about that, but the Insights tab has a more graphical way of uh, showing where all the branches are. Yeah, most branches you will do are locally, unless there are big ones that are pushed where most people are working on the same thing. Mm. Branches can be visualized. It just depends what kind of tool you want to use for it. So let's say you're working together on a project with the three of you, and uh, you're all, you have your master domain branch thing, yeah. and you're all working on a different feature, um, and then going home, and then the next day, what would be like the way to go to make sure that you're not merging or pulling or um, like how? From my experience, a general workflow when it comes to adding changes and committing them back into uh, the whole project. Let's say you work in the morning, um, you've pulled the most recent changes. Um, eventually, when you've done all your code, uh, or at least done the code for that day, there are two things you can do. Either you don't commit it at all and just wait from, uh, just start next morning again uh, on top of the old changes, or you write a commit. It's one way to do it, it's not the best way, but it's at least one way to keep track of the code so far, is that you just do a regular commit message like you would do if it was finished, but then at the end you say bracket, WIP for work in progress, and then another bracket. It's one thing I do sometimes. It's at least a nice way to always have the code online, um, even though it might not be finished yet. So in that way, there are still some uh, piece of code that could be online if you want to pull those into your own repo. Any other questions? Yeah, small question. Um, so when you do git pull, you get the stuff from the master, right? Uh, you can choose what kind of branch you want to pull. Um, uh, that's why I think it's also uh, yeah so in this case yeah. it says git pull origin master origin of course referring to the repo you want to pull from uh, but master is the branch that you want to pull from yeah in general if you have only one branch you also just git pull you can also do it without origin master because it just defaults to the first one you can find which is only this one in case but you can always specify the branch you want to pull. It does have to be on uh, the repo, mm -hmm. because otherwise it doesn't know where to pull from. No. So if you're working in a project with three and you're all working in a different branch, yeah. and you pull all those branches separately before you start coding? Um, nice. No. Uh, normally if you have features, for example, a main branch, someone else is working on the user interface, someone else is working on um, user input validation, mm -hmm. you only pull most of the time what's in the master branch, because the features that are in the master branch are also features that are actually tested and work and are finished. Um, so often you only want to work on the code base which is stable, okay. uh, which in this case means only pulling the main branch unless there's some other um, things you've specified in your team. And how would you advise doing mini shell, for example? <laughs> well, I'm not there yet, I think, thankfully. But <laughs> oh, yeah, so working with yeah. two people together and... With two people, yeah. um, I would start with a main branch. Yeah. Um, try to get some kind of initial working version on a branch. It can be a little bit dirty with commits, but first get an initial working version. Because from that point on, you can split the branch into multiple parts for someone to work on. Yeah. Um, when I was first starting, I would name the branch Ruben, and know someone else branch Rafael. In hindsight, not the best choice, <laughs> but uh, a good way of naming your branches would be for what the what the goal is of that branch. Yeah. For example, feature user input or feature redirections, for example. Uh, and then when you've done the feature, you integrate it back into the main branch, uh, and then another the person can pull those changes, and yeah. now they have the re most recent version of the code base they can work on top mm -hmm. of. In that way, you can always test changes. So normally you use a branch for a short period of time? Um, often, yes, unless there are certain uh, different things you can have. I, with the most of the projects I did, there was also a release branch. That branch would always exist, <laughs> and it would be the branch that would be tested um, as a final test, and that would be put on the production branch eventually, or the production uh, just on the servers online. So you can have multiple branches, the nice thing about branches is they can you specify yourself what they are for. Yeah. Uh, most often, making that structure is a little bit difficult, but you can specify yourself what each branch is for. Thank you. Um, I have another question from uh, the Flying Dutchman. I think you know who I'm talking about, Nils. <laughs> uh, do you have some tips on organizing organizing your repos on GitHub, adding to an organization, etc.? Uh, one it's more time, like the last part. <laughs> Uh, adding to an organization 
something right. like that. Uh, I'm assuming an organization in this case is, uh, for example, I think I can pull that from one of the slides. Um, I hope it's shown here. No, I guess it isn't. Well, if, if they mean organization in the way that GitHub uh, does an organization, you can, well, I guess it's sort of a, you can start a company on GitHub. I, for example, one for my company as well called Louder Minds. And there I store all the projects which are related to client, pro, uh, client um, well, projects. Um, if you work in an organization, often there's one person who manages the whole organization. Uh, they will manage who gets the tickets. They will manage what branches are created for the eventual online version. Um, and often uh, when you want to manage those, I guess you just have one person making the bigger choices, one make, person making the smaller choices. Uh, and organizing that way, yeah, uh, it's really up to you eventually. There are some things you can look up online, uh, but often it just has to be something which feels a little bit intuitive. All right, any other questions? Um, so that's more like an opinion, but like what's your opinion about um, tools to ease the Git workflow, like Git flow? Oh yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I, I, would, I've, I would figure Git flow is a little bit too difficult for the basics, but I can explain it. Um, sadly, I don't have a slide on it. Git flow is a op opinionated way of structuring, structuring your uh, Git branches. You know, for example, I have a release branch, a develop branch, smaller feature branches, hotfix branches, um, and these branches sort of define what the goal is uh, of the commit that gets in there. Let's say you have a production environment. Um, I can remember, for example, Google, they, I think it was about a year ago, suddenly like half their services crashed. If you own Google, by any chance, uh, and you want to um, suddenly create a, a pretty quick fix, you would create a hotfix branch, which is often based on the uh, release branch. Um, then you create the hotfix branch, you add some changes, and you merge them back into the release branch. This way, uh, you have certain branches which have a certain goal, um, and Gitflow sort of gives uh, a structure of how to do that. Gitflow also has a tool with how to create branches, but it's more of a opinionated way to structure your branches. Um, I think you can just look it up on Gitflow. If you just Google it, you could probably find a big page, which is just one long page, explaining what the thought process is behind Gitflow. I think that's pretty much it uh, from Gitflow. Any other questions? Do you all have a question? There's one in front here. Um, everyone watch out for head. <laughs> yeah, can I show one? Um, can you only branch from the master, or can you also branch from branches? You can also branch from other branches. Um, that way, yeah, it's definitely possible. Uh, for example, if you have a main branch or a release branch, and um, you want to add change to that, you could have a whole thing branch. But the release branch could, for example, uh, be like the second branch that already has been created. You just have multiple streams of your version of the project that are going on, and on each separate branch, you can add more branches and integrate those into smaller ones. In general, a branch is just a way to create a new process of your project, um, and, and eventually when you finish, finish the, pro uh, the process, you can add it back into the branch that you were working on. Yeah, there are multiple branches you can create. I think that's uh, pretty much the last question. Oh, one in the back still. <laughs> yeah, do you know of a way um, with uh, the problem we, we're having now is basically with the uh, merging, uh, we get a m lot of merge conflicts basically because of the header uh, file, of the, 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 the codom header we have to uh, use. Yeah, that so we, like we keep getting uh, uh, merge conflicts because of that. So do you know uh, of a way how to basically yeah, prevent merge that's, conflicts that's, just yeah. because of that? There is definitely a way to do that. It's a little bit more on the advanced side, uh, but often when you create change to your Git, uh, in your files at least, Git can track single parts in your file. Uh, when you want to add a file, you don't have to add every change to the file. You can add small bits of your file as a change. Um, that's one part that's a little bit, I don't have it here, <laughs> but uh, if you want to look it up, you can just look up how to um, commit smaller parts of your file. Um, it, often I think you just have to git add on the file and then maybe the file lines. I think that's one of the ways of how to do it. But in that way, you can always um, integrate everything except for the header files. What you could also do is just include all the header files, or at least all the header parts at the end. <laughs> just like, don't do it at all yeah. until you're at the last step in your project. Or if you want to you know, pull all your hairs out for the next four weeks, you can just add it at the beginning. 
Okay, um, any other questions? I've been, I, I, I can give a short, short explanation of that. I sort of failed high school. I did have my diploma eventually, but after a couple of years, I just, just said, fuck it, and didn't focus on high school anymore. I started programming, um, and yeah, I've been doing that for the last four or five years. I started when I was 14. Yes, thank you.